Hey, we're Mark and Brenda Burgrain, and today we're gonna to be talking about our best tips for outdoor wedding photography. Let's get right to it. Our first tip when it comes to photographing weddings outside is regarding the midday sun. Odds are something is gonna be happening in the middle of the day and you're gonna to have to photograph it and you can't have golden hour all day long. So battling the midday sun is super important. Our first suggestion is to shoot in the shade. Go find the shade of a tree, the edge of a forest, or the side of a building. It restricts where you can shoot, but shooting in the shade allows nice, soft light on the subject, but it also causes you to not be able to expose for the background. So sometimes if you have the sky in the background of the shot, the sky will be a little bit overexposed. So you can either choose to exclude that from your frame or you can include it and just let it go. But making sure that you're exposing for the skin tones when you're shooting in the shade is usually the best option. The other thing about shooting in the midday sun is angling your clients is super important. So making sure that even if the sun is midday usually it has some angle to it it's not just straight down but if you can turn your clients so that the sun is behind them you're going to have the best option or the best exposure on their face so if you can angle them just right and you can look at the light on their face and make sure the sun is as behind them as it can be even though it's still coming from overhead that'll give you the best exposure so if shooting in the shade isn't working for you or you don't have any shade to work with and angling isn't just isn't working for you, the third option is to overpower the sun. And that works by using an off-camera flash that has enough power to illuminate the subject after darkening the background. So you're going to be shooting at like f11 or somewhere around there in order to to darken the scene enough to add in that off-camera flash and illuminate the subject. Um, we'll have more on off-camera flash in a later video. And the last and final suggestion for shooting in the middle of the day is just embrace it and shoot the midday light. And that's kind of the opposite of our angling tip. You're gonna have people angling towards the sun so that they get the most direct light on them as possible. And it helps if you can, you know, trying to do this when the sun is directly overhead isn't possible, but if it's slightly in the afternoon or slightly in the morning, shooting direct sun is possible. Um, it might not be the best looking light, but sometimes it can be interesting, especially if you put a bright subject against a dark background and kind of contrast that bright and dark, it can create a cool look. One key thing to do when you're shooting direct sun is to expose for the highlights and not let anything get blown out, especially the skin tone. So you're going to want to make sure that when you look at the picture, there's no bright white in the frame. So when you look at the back of the screen, you don't, you can look at the histogram and make sure that the, nothing is blown out, or you can just look at it and make sure that you have all the natural color preserved. Cause if it's overexposed, you won't be able to bring it back. So if, if you're going to err one side or the other, I always encourage people to err on the side of underexposed because it's easier to bring back shadows than it is highlights. And my last suggestion when it comes to midday sun is if you're shooting large groups, opt for the shade. We try to, usually we try to do whatever we can to find even the smallest pocket of shade that will fit the group we're working with because when it comes to group photos, it's mostly about the people and not as much about the scenery. So you wanna make sure that people aren't squinting or closing their eyes and that they look natural. Sometimes this tip to work in the shade doesn't always work because a lot of times people choose a location because they're excited to have that in the background of the photos, but it's your job as a photographer to figure out how you're gonna make that work. So sometimes you just have to shoot with that view and figure out your exposure and make it work. Second tip carries on with the idea of the midday sun and working around that to create the best photos possible. The way we do that is by controlling the timeline. The more trust your clients have in you, the more they will let you control the timeline. So that's an important lead up to controlling the timeline is building trust. 
But when it comes to controlling the timeline, you can't shoot everything at golden hour. So we try to put the most important things happening during the best light. And for us, that's usually portraits and sometimes ceremony. I often encourage ceremonies in the late afternoon, allowing us enough time to shoot any group portraits after the ceremony that we need to get done, and then setting us up with somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes of really nice golden light right before they go to whatever the next event is. And if you build a lot of trust with your couples, you might even get them to schedule their whole day around the best light. We've shot weddings where we do the ceremony at sunrise and then we shoot some portraits and then we shoot more portraits at sunset and it's just the whole day is scheduled around the light. That's not usually typical, but if you build a lot of trust and you have the right clients, you can make it happen. So when it comes to planning out the lighting for the day, we use mainly two apps. Uh, first one is Photo Pills and I'll link it down in the description. Second one is the Photographer's Ephemeris and the Photographer's Ephemeris 3D. And that allows you to figure out where the light is gonna be, when it's gonna be setting, not just general sunset time, but specifically in a specific location where the sun is gonna be, what angle, and when it's gonna go behind the ridge line or the mountains or wherever it's gonna land. Our third tip is about controlling the direction of the sun. We've already talked about this a little bit, but thinking about it in relation to the ceremony site, usually they're not planned around the direction of the sun. So thinking about how you can move and put yourself in a position that maximizes that light. So sometimes ceremonies will be set up so people are looking directly into the sun and squinting, and that's not ideal but if you can use that to your advantage and use that beautiful direct sunlight to capture the reactions of the people, or if you can create something interesting, maybe you can create a silhouette of the couple as you shoot into the sun. It really just is up to your creativity on how you're gonna maneuver and use that to your advantage. Our next tip, our fourth tip of the day, has to do with depth of field. And maybe I'll talk a little bit about compression as well. Most of our couples that are choosing an outdoor wedding photographer or an outdoor wedding are focused on the beauty of the location. They've chosen to get married in the mountains or on the beach or somewhere really beautiful where the, the setting is important to them. The environment is important to them. And so in order to be able to capture that, you have to be aware of how your camera is seeing the location. When we're talking about depth of field, we're talking about aperture. A lot of times people want to shoot on their low aperture so that they can get that cool effect that we can't get from our iPhones to show that we're the professionals, here's a professional camera. But sometimes a higher aperture will allow the background to be sharp and crisp and make you feel like you're there in the photo. So don't be afraid to play with your aperture and figure out what it is that you want to show in the photo and what aperture will best show that. I do love a blurry background. Sometimes I love a blurry subject where the background's sharp. You just have to be willing to play with your depth of field in order to tell a story. Those fast lenses where you can shoot nice and low like 1.2, you really have to make sure that you're getting your subject sharp. One of the things we love to do is use a wide angle lens. We really love the 16 to 35 for landscape portraits and even for wide ceremony shots or wide reception shots. We want to be able to have a nice scene setting shot in addition to more close-ups so that we can tell a story in a very clear, all-encompassing way. We also really like using a 70 to 200 or a nice long lens for compression. So if you think about having your couple here and the mountains are way off in the distance but it's a beautiful view, you want to be able to use your long lens to compress the subject with the background to make those mountains look big and majestic like they look in real life but that using that technique will allow them to have that nice impact another aspect of depth of field that i really like is using some foreground some blurry foreground to create some extra framing around my couple so maybe i'm going to shoot through the trees maybe i'm going to th shoot through the grass um, this creates you know really nice vibrancy to the photo um, and makes it super interesting. Essentially what we're saying when we're talking about depth of field and compression is that outdoor wedding photography often means 
that being outside is important. Therefore, we wanna use different photo techniques in order to capture the scenery and make it part of the story. Tip number five is to knock down power lines and other distractions. Something that has happened over the years is that Mark and I can no longer go somewhere and not notice power lines or trash cans or distracting elements. Often you're walking around your everyday life and you just see these things, they just blend into the background. But when you're trying to take a nice clean landscape picture and tell a story, suddenly all you see is that power line that's just right behind your bride's head. Uh, or that trash can that's bright blue and is right over there in the side of the picture. And so it's important to notice these things ahead of time. It'll save you time in your editing to try to find that clean backdrop. Try to find a way to eliminate the distractions so that you can focus on your subject. We're not big on heavy Photoshop or making things look like how they weren't. We want to capture what's actually there. But something like a pimple, we're going to get rid of that because you won't have that pimple tomorrow. Something like a trash can, we're going to get rid of that because that's not something that's part of the scene. I'm trying to tell a true story of what's there, but power lines aren't necessarily a critical element of the story. So sometimes you can get low to the ground in order to get an angle where you're not, the power lines aren't in your shot or where the power lines are in the sky in a way that's gonna be really easy to edit and post. Um, and so you just wanna think about like, how clean can I make this photo? Our sixth tip for outdoor wedding photography is to dress for the elements. If you're gonna be working outside in the elements, you need to be prepared. For us, that means we're wearing nice shoes that have good grip that we can be climbing on rocks and walking through grass and walking through mud and walking through dirt. We want to have sturdy shoes that can help us handle whether it's muddy or dusty or rocky or steep, whatever the elements are, we have to be prepared for them. If it's cold, I want to make sure I have a jacket, a hat, gloves. I'll be in a puppy jacket, hat, and gloves, and scarf, and then there's a bride just in a wedding dress. But the reality is I need to be warm, I need to be comfortable in order to be able to take pictures and be creative. We also tell our clients other things that help them prepare for the environment. So we shoot a lot of outdoor weddings, we shoot a lot in the mountains, our couples are climbing on top of rocks. Some brides can do that in their high heels, but most of them need to have a sturdier shoe. If you're near the edge of a cliff, you definitely want some good shoes so you're not worrying about that. We tell our brides that if we're gonna be somewhere windy, they need to think about that when they're doing their hair. When the hairstylist thinks they have enough hairspray, tell them to add a little bit more. We prepare our clients for the elements by telling them to deal with their hair, their shoes, what they're wearing, making sure they're having warm layers, snacks, whatever it might be. Being prepared will help us not have a barrier to creating the best photos that we can. Sometimes being prepared means being prepared for your clients. Uh, we tell couples that come from out of town all the time that it's probably gonna be cold and still it's good for us to have an extra puppy, extra gloves, hand warmers, an umbrella. It's good to have extra things available to help handle the elements. If it starts raining, you wanna be prepared for that. If it starts snowing, you wanna be prepared for that. We don't want a little rain or a little snow to keep us from capturing the great photos and telling the story of the day. It is about foreground or layering and we've drawn a lot of inspiration from landscape photography and adventure photography and it's important to have layers in your frame to create depth. People will often talk about foreground, middle ground, background and that's something we strive to create. It's not always possible or just doesn't always happen but having that layered foreground element really helps to it can define your subject or create leading lines or it can isolate something and a lot of times you can also have a difference in uh, exposure so you can have a dark subject and a bright background or vice versa and it can create a little bit more dynamic image we also find that layers really help your eye move through the frame so using those to direct your attention to whatever subject you want to emphasize, usually the wedding couple can be really effective.
So our eighth tip is exposing for the highlights. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but I wanted to mention it again just because it's important. So exposing for the highlights means making sure that nothing in the frame is overexposed. So if you look at, you can either look at the back of the screen and make sure that there's no clipped highlights. That's a feature that most cameras have where you can turn on and see, they'll give you flashing lights for areas that are completely overexposed, which means there's no data. Or you can look at the histogram and make sure that when you look at that chart, you don't have a bunch of data that's all the way to that one side where it's overexposed. The reason for this is because exposing for the highlights gives you the maximum amount of data to work with. If it's completely blown out, overexposed, you'll, you won't have any information to work with there. Whereas if it's underexposed, usually you can recover that shadow detail a lot more easily with editing software. So I always try to underexpose a bit instead of if I blow things out, it's completely gone, can't do anything about it. The only exception to this is if you're doing it intentionally, that might be if you're shooting inside and the windows are blown out and you're maybe you're using that as a backdrop to create a silhouette or you're doing something that you intentionally want that to be overexposed. The other reason is if you're shooting in the middle of the day and sometimes you're gonna prioritize skin tones or people over the sky or the brightest part of the frame. So it's a creative decision or an intentional decision if you don't have enough dynamic range to capture all of that. So tip number nine is about dynamic range. As I was mentioning, exposing for the highlights, your camera has a limited amount of data that it can capture. And with today's, camera, it's usually, today's cameras, it's usually a little less than what the eye can see. So the best cameras out there have around like 15 stops of dynamic range, and that's the, the amount of information between the darkest darks and the brightest brights. So when you're planning out a photograph, you wanna make sure that your camera can capture the scene and all the information you want it to. We've found there's a few tools that we sometimes use that help with this. Uh, first off is a graduated neutral density filter, which is basically just a graduated sunglass type filter that goes over your lens and darkens usually the sky and brings that value a little bit lower so the scene can be more evenly exposed. The other thing that we found to be really effective is polarizing filters and they just cut out a bunch of that reflection. They can also darken the sky a little bit depending on what direction you're angled. Um, you have to be careful with that because sometimes they'll create weird dark spots that don't look natural. But if you're shooting 90 degrees from the sun, they do a great job of cutting that reflection and bringing the, the sky to a little bit more blue and darker color. They also are really effective during almost any daylight time at just cutting off little reflections off of like grass and anything that water is, they're really good at cutting reflection on water, but I think people misunderstand that when you're shooting anywhere, there's always reflections off of leaves and grass and anything around, and polarizers can really help cut that down and make your images a little bit more colorful. Tips for maximizing dynamic range would be get the best camera you can and use a polarizer and graduated neutral density filter. And I think if you combine all three of those, you won't have a problem. We have two more bonus tips. We've decided to create separate videos for those. Just so you know what's coming, we're gonna be talking about outdoor wedding photography lighting. So some of that off camera flash that Mark was talking about, how do you overpower the sun and what are some of the different techniques to do that. And the next one's gonna be about outdoor night photography. A lot of times we end the wedding day with a star photo. How do we do that? Thanks for coming by. We know there was a lot of information there. Go back, take notes, or hit us up with any comments and questions below. Yeah, we love hearing from you and we appreciate your time watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.